Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, I'll be reviewing the Alpha Mini direct drive wheelbase from the guys at Sim Magic, a true servo motor equipped wheelbase system with a peak torque rating of 10 newton meters. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Let's take a closer look at this Alpha Mini from Sim Magic. So this looks just like the regular Alpha. Of course, it's smaller as far as the dimensions go. It doesn't weigh as much. This comes in at 14 pounds, or just over 14 pounds, which is 6.3 kilos for everybody else in the world. It has 10 newton meters of peak torque versus the 15 newton meters of the regular Alpha. And we'll see how that feels once we're in the cockpit and driving it. It is 170 millimeters long from the back casing, which appears to be metal, to the front lip here of the flange. And then we have another 100 millimeters from there to the end of the wheelbase side quick release system. And I do like the hub that they have on here that connects to the motor shaft. It's a pretty clean look to it, and you don't see any bolts on the sides anywhere. It's very clean all the way around. It has a carbon fiber ring around the front part. And this is where they are putting their transceiver for the wireless duties, which is, by the way, a very good solution. I liked it on the M10 that I tested. And yeah, it's just the way to go if you ask me. The other wheel out there that is a true wireless wheel, or you can use it as a true wireless wheelbase, the SimuCube. Remember when I did review on that one, it had a plastic window on the back here where the electronics packages are sitting. And yeah, not optimal, obviously, if you have a wheel sitting on in front here with the wheels transceiver for the wireless sitting over here. It has to go around the wheel and any mount that you might have sitting up here. And then they went to a stubby antenna sticking out the back. And the latest is a 90 degree bent antenna that you put on the back and it. Not quite sticking above the motor casing though. I'm not sure why they do it that way. But anyway, this, as I think most would agree, is probably the best way to go because you have it right up front here. And yes, you have to have a special pathway or some kind of a tunnel in here to run your wires for supporting this transceiver that's in the front. And of course, SimMagic, obviously, when they made their servos or had them made, designed that into it. Now, when we have the wheel sitting on the front, and I'll use this one as an example, you can see that the SimMagic wireless wheels have their wireless receiver up here a transceiver or whatever you want to call it and it's sitting right where this one is even when you're turning it it's still in much closer proximity than something sitting in the back here trying to get around the metal of the casing and any metal on the motor mounts so yeah i never had any problems with dropouts or anything with this but i never had any problems with dropouts on the semi cube i had either but the signal got weak when i was turning the wheel this one stays pretty steady as you might imagine so yeah Kudos to SimMagic for using that in their servo motors and their M2, which is a stepper motor system. So yeah, I like what I'm seeing on that. We have a flange here that is tapped on the holes here for mounting. Those are M8s. And this is a 92 millimeter centers on these holes, which will fit the three front plate or front mount cockpit motor mounts that I have tested with it so far. So it does fit that, which is very good. I was worried that it wouldn't fit that, even though they do have a side mount system for it right here. And we'll look at that when we go through the mounting segment on the review. But yeah, I like the way they did that. And they have some holes on the side. These are M6s. And I believe these are 50, if I remember correctly. Let me measure that again. I believe those are 50 centers on the side. Yeah, they're 50 centers on the sides. But on the bottom, we also have a pattern of holes. And they're in a square pattern. I believe they were in 60, 67, looks like centers on that. And I think there's 67 the other way too. And this is so we can take the wheelbase. No, that's actually 80 this way. Okay, so about 67 this way and 80 the other way. Let me put this down while I'm doing this. It might make it a little easier. Yeah, about 67 there. So you can 
have a flat plate that you mount this to, drill some holes in it that matches this pattern, and then you can come up underneath with some M6 bolts and bolt it down securely to the flat plate if that's how you want to mount it. What else can we talk about? Well, let's talk about the connections. Now, this little piece on the back, the cap here, again, this is where the electronics packages are being mounted along with the encoder or resolver, whatever they happen to be using for this servo motor's position sensing. And we have a couple of ports here. We have a USB and we have power. And on the other side, we've got the CAN bus, which looks like USB, and that's for programming. And then we have another one called Safe B, which would be the emergency stop, which I do not have with this wheelbase. And I don't know if they're available yet or if it's something they're developing for the future use, but I'm sure that's what that's for. Anything else we want to talk about here? Not much. The contacts on the front, you see? One here, this is a wireless wheel. Why does it have contacts? <laughs> well, because this wheel needs power to light up the LEDs that's in it. And SimMagic, obviously, if you've seen the reviews before, I'm not reviewing the wheel back here because I already did that with the... I can't remember which one it was. I think I, I reviewed it on its own. But yeah, this is where they get the power to power the LEDs on the wheel because they're, they require more power than just like running a USB board on a button plate wheel and yeah just for switches and things like that it doesn't require as much power but when you start throwing LEDs on there yeah that's going to require more power so that's how they get that. All right pretty clean as you can see with the whole package here. The power supply you get is a switching power supply that will recognize what the input voltage is and switch to that so we're here at 115 volt in North America so it'll switch that automatically and if you're over in Europe or Asia and you have the 240 it will switch to that now it is a 36 volt max at 6 amps that's peak for this power supply and that's 216 watt and it feels pretty light actually for a 36 volt power supply but we'll see how that works once it gets there or actually once we get there and we're using it it's got a light over here, and this turns green when you power it up. We have a strain relief for the cable that goes in, that goes out to our motor itself, and it has a ferrite core on it, a rather large one, which is nice because at least they're paying attention and making an effort to mitigate EMI interference with this motor with other things. We have a four-pin connector on here. Get a good shot of that there. And it has a key system to it. And you can see that little notch hanging down there. And we have a little piece on the bottom that's flat that determines where it goes. We also have two little maintaining clips or tension clips there that have these little dimples on them. Not sure how well you're going to see that, but there they are. And it has a flat piece here that has an arrow on it that indicates which way we need to mount this. And the arrow means mount the flat part towards the front of the wheel. So we'll go ahead and see if that works. So I got the arrow, front of the wheels that way. See if I can plug it in. Yep, no problem. There we have it. Pretty simple. Now, the power cord that they send with this, now this is a European 240 power cord because it's got these funky blades on it. It's not a 115, which is no big deal because it's the same plug on the back as you know computer plugs, things like that. It usually. You have a few of these cables laying around somewhere in your house. At least I do. <laughs> and I'll use one of mine that's one for 115, no problem, because remember, again, this will automatically detect the voltage and switch to that. Now, here's the one thing I'm not crazy about, and who was it? Uh, some experience did the same thing with their wheel. It's the switch in line with the power cord. See that? Instead of putting a switch on the back here, like Fanatec does, SimuCube does, they put it on the cord here. When, you know, I can't believe there's not enough room to put a little switch back here. But, you know, it is what it is. This is what we get, a switch on the cord. And I'm crazy about this because you have to plug this into a socket or a power strip somewhere. And then you're going to run this over to your power supply on the back over here. And then you're going to have the switch dangling around on the cord somewhere. Not that convenient to get to if you want to turn it on and off quickly. Whereas you can actually reach around the back on these other ones and just hit the button and you're good to go. So, not as elegant as the wireless solution. <laughs> you know, it's funny, a lot of products that come through here at the SRG, I'll see something like the way they do their wireless solution, go, wow, you know, that's the way to do it. And then 
then you get this with it too, though. And I'm thinking, wow, that's really not the way to do it. But it's usable. It'll get the job done at the end of the day. You know, I'm not going to argue with that. But yeah, they, I think they could have done a little better with the solution for your power on and off. But there you have it. We get a pack of M6 screws here. These are pan heads or button heads, whatever you want to call them. And it comes with a wrench to be able to tighten them. We get two links. We get a 15 millimeter and a 10 millimeter bolt, depending on what you're mounting it to. At least they give you two different links and they give you five of each because there's only four holes. You do have an extra screw, which is awful nice to have an extra screw. And then we have different depths. So if your plate that you're mounting it to on the bottom is thicker or thinner, you have a screw that will accommodate, hopefully. <laughs> of course, my luck, it'll be right between, right? All right, so let's talk about the only accessory that I got with this and they sent me was this bracket. It's a mounting bracket and it's very slick looking, you know, just like the rest of the Sim Magic products. It's, it's well finished, very professional presentation. This has little indentations here because we're going to be using this. They send you a little pack like this that has some button heads and some flathead screws in it. And they also send you some spring ball T-nuts. Very nice. So if you're going to mount this to profile, you can put your T-nuts in there. And then, of course, you run a bolt through it, this, and then mount it that way. And they give you a couple of wrenches for the different sizes of bolts. So that comes with that kit. These have some nice counterboard or beveled countersunk holes in it. So you can adjust the height or angle of your wheelbase. And it mounts like this. We have a, this is, you have a right side and a left side plate, but we'll get to that in detail. But we just mount this with these two holes because you can see they are also countersunk. So we can put a flathead in there. It won't interfere with the bracket. Is it, this is right and right? Yeah. The bracket can go up and down like that. But we'll get to more detail once we get to the mounting section. I'll probably be mounting this on a front mount wheel mount when I'm actually driving it. Anything else I want to talk about? I think that's it. Uh, price? Well, they have an introductory price. They sent me this little flyer thing that they're going to be sending everyone that is $500 until the end of August. So by the time you see this review, it's gonna, probably going to be halfway through August already. And I just got the flyer like last week. So it was supposed to be going on for a couple of months, according to the flyer. But yeah, I wasn't paying attention to any of that. So anyway, $500. And then I don't know what it's going to be after that. I've seen it advertised at $530 at, at some website somewhere. And so I, I guess that gives an indication maybe that's where it will be. I don't know. So again, that's something that I can't tell you. I just don't know yet the final answer on that. So yeah, that's the closer look. First thing we'll do on our look inside is take a look at the front assembly on the wheelbase. And that consists of the quick release on the front here. This has some traces on it or contacts, if you will. And you can see there's four of them, but there's really only three. The middle one in the very center here is a ground or rather. Yeah, that's a ground. Then we have these two pieces here. They are five volts positive and you can see they're joined in the middle. So they're essentially the same thing. And then on the outside, it's supposed to be a ground too. I couldn't get ground off of this. I tried to, I could get a five volts from using, measuring from this ground over here to this pad. But when I went from this pad back over to where the five volts was, I couldn't get anything. So I'm not sure what's that, the function of the, that ground is, but yeah, it just didn't work. But anyway, so what we're going to do here, and by the way, before we get there, these contact points obviously are for the pins inside of our quick releases on all the Sim Magic wheels. There's five pins in there. They're spring loaded so that when you attach your wheel to it, it will provide constant pressure on these contact points so that the power can go back and forth to power our steering wheel. So the first thing we're going to do is pull this off. And there are no less than six, I believe it's six, isn't it? Yeah. Six 2.5 millimeter wrench size bolts on here. I believe they're four mil or M4s rather. So we're going to go ahead and take these off. Now, when you take something like this off and you're trying to hold it, if they're really tight from the factory, you might have to, let me get my 2.5 out here. And I always use one of these to initially loosen bolts, not one of these little T wrenches or whatever, so that, yeah, you can get the proper torque on it. So sometimes it might be hard for you to hold this to get these loose, all right? But it depends on the wheel and all that stuff, if there's any Loctite in here. 
And I think I can get these to go just by holding it. Here we go. They are tight. So again, that's why I'm using this wrench to get them loose. So I didn't have to use my strap wrench yet. But when we get to the inside of this hub, I might have to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of these broken loose. So as soon as I did that, I could see it's kind of, I can feel it kind of loose on the top here. So that's a 2.5, and I'm going to take one of my little speed wrenches here and just go ahead and take these off. I'll get my little magnetic dish out here so I don't lose anything. Last thing you want to do when you're doing this kind of stuff is lose the screws. And they're not very big. Look to be about 8 mil long, I imagine. I'll give you a close-up shot of that. Little flathead screw. It's like stainless steel units. Uh, maybe not. It's sticking pretty good. All right, so we'll go ahead and get these off. All right, I got the screws loose. Let me go ahead and get the rest of them out. You can see it kind of moved on me there when I was down to two of them. So you want to obviously pay attention to what's going on when you're doing that. Because if you have contacts on the front like we do here, then obviously there's going to be some wires behind it. So you want to be careful when you lift this up. And you can see there are some wires there. And if you look down inside of here, there's a plug. Let's see if I can get this a little closer. You guys can see that. There's a white plug in there. See that? And that's obviously giving the contact going through the hub here. And we'll look at that a little bit more detail here. What I'm going to do is try to get this out. And I have a set of long needle nose pliers here for electronics. And just grab the plug on the sides and just kind of wiggle it from side to side as I put a little pressure on it to get it loose. Again, you want to be very careful when you're doing this. You don't want to break anything because that's going to make you fix things which you don't want to fix. I think I got it loose there, and there it is. All right, it's a little Molex plug there. I'll give you a close look inside of what that looks like. If I can get it focused. There it is. All right. And again, a close up of the front contact piece. Nice little aluminum piece here. The finish is nice on this. So now what we've got to do is get this hub off. And it's typical of a direct drive wheel that's a servo motor, you're going to have a clamping hub on here. And inside of this one, we have four bolts. See those black bolts there? And what I'm going to have to do is loosen these up. Now, they're going to be tight. So I'm going to use a little tool here to help me do this. Now, I believe these are 3 mil. I already got my 3 mil wrench here. Yes, 3 mil. And I'm going to use this strap wrench. And that simply just goes around this. And of course, you need to put it in the correct orientation. So if I'm turning this way, I want to be able to hold the hub going torque this way. So I'm going to be turning this counterclockwise, but the torque for me to hold is going to be clockwise this way. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this up right in the middle there, like that. And it'll just kind of stay there. So now we'll get our wrench out and we're going after those bolts. I go ahead and get that in there, hold the wrench like this. So as I do this, I have some counter pressure. Ah, there we go. And we get that off of there. All right, so I've got them loose. I'll go ahead and loosen this back up so I can get it off. Loosen a little more. There we go. Again, this thing is a lifesaver for a lot of stuff, one of these strap wrenches. I highly recommend you have one of these somewhere in your toolbox. Different sizes, too. All right, so I've got these bolts in here loose. So all of them are loose. A little wire out of the way there. But this hub is not going to come off yet because it's already squeezed down on there and just loosening the bolts doesn't get it out. So what I'm going to do is loosen these up a bit, maybe, I don't know, three, four millimeters, just so I've got plenty of room when it was ready to release, it will release. Go get them up. And if you look down in here, I'll show you this. There are a couple of holes. Most of these type of hubs will have a self-pressing feature on it. So that once we put some bolts in these, you see these little two holes in there? We got four of the bolts there. We got the hole in the top and we got one on the bottom. Normally, you would just take one of these bolts out. These are M4s. Put one in each one of those holes with these loose, obviously. You want to kind of make sure they're loose first or you'll never get it off. Then we're going to use those two bolts that are in those empty holes there to actually press this hub off. All right? 
Now I've got a couple of them somewhere around. Oh, I've got them in my dish here. So I've got these guys. These are my M4 bolts, and they're long enough. These are about 25 mil long. And I'm going to just put them in those holes. I'm going to turn this up to do it, so you won't be able to see me actually do that. But you'll know what I'm doing. And yeah. So we get these started. And remember, you've got to have the other bolts loose or you're wasting your time. <laughs> you end up breaking, snapping a bolt, I imagine, or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and run these down to where they're making contact. And these are a little snugger than the bolts that I took out. No, actually, it broke free there. It went down easy. Okay. So now the bolts are down to where they're making contact and won't go down anymore without more pressure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this. I think I can hold this and press these down, just like tightening them up. And this is going to lift this hub up. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you where those bolts are right now. I'm going to wire out of the way. All right, there you go. So we're going to be tightening that one and this other one over here. See how that goes. Hopefully, it'll loosen it up. Okay, that came off pretty good, actually. So once you tighten those downs, it will release. And now we can take this up. Now, there's probably going to be some wiring in here. So again, we want to be very careful what we're doing here. I'm going to lift it up, and I'm just going to kind of look down in here and make sure I don't have any wires. If you look in there, there are no wires. It's all clean in there. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and take this off. And here's the hub. And on the bottom of the hub, we have another plate here. See this one there? And this is the plate that has some electronics on it. Now, this is a magnetically coupled section in here that will send current into this piece. If you ever know, if you guys know what a transformer is, it takes a certain voltage and then either kicks it up or kicks it down but there's a gap between the, t the coils or the, the, wrap, the wire windings. This is the same principle. So we're using magnetic field to induce the current in this. And of course, the circuitry is going to control that current so that it gives the proper power to our steering wheel. I'm going to go ahead and take this one loose. Now remember, this is magnetic stuff. So typically, we're going to find plastic screws in here. So let me get a little closer look at that. So these are actually nylon screws. Because you can't put metal screws in here. If you do, it's they're gonna yeah, it's gonna mess things up because they're they will turn magnetic and yeah, it's just gonna mess things up. Not a good idea. So these are plastic or nylon. So you have to be careful taking them out and putting them back in. So you want to be gentle with this stuff. And I'm gonna carefully turn it. And they shouldn't be too tight either. They should be easy to get out. But I'm always very cautious with this stuff because I don't want yeah, we'd have a big problem here if I strip one of these out. Well, maybe not. I think I got some laying around, but yeah, you don't want to do it anyway if you don't have to. So this screw's coming out. Let me show you what that one looks like. All right, so nothing really to see here. This is, looks like to be an M3 maybe, maybe even an, an M2.5, but it's a very small flat head, as you can see from that shot. And you can see when I drop those in, they don't make the ching sound, <laughs> being plastic and all. So again, and I'm paying attention, very close attention to how this is coming off because I want to make sure that I put this back on exactly the same way it came off. Now, we have this wire going through the hub and it's going to be connected to the board on the other side. I'm just going to pull the board apart so you can take a look. I could unplug it, but I think this is enough here. Showing you the circuitry here on the inside. Now, this is receiving a magnetic field and that makes this create its own current pretty neat huh so that's how they're powering it wirelessly very very slick i like the way they did this more manufacturers are starting to do this kind of thing yeah sim magic is doing it the right way i think all right so now that we know how this is working let's go ahead and pull this one off i believe this is two mil let me see here. What we're going to pull off now is, or maybe not pull it off, but pull it apart so you guys can see it, is this carbon fiber ring around here. This should have some wires going to it in another circuit board like we just saw in this piece, right? Should have the counterpart under here. And we should see a wireless transceiver in here too. So I'm going to go ahead and carefully loosen these up. 
But again, there's going to be some wires in here, so I want to be careful with what I'm doing. This is a two millimeter hex in here. And these are actually metal, I believe. You see these little guys. There we go. And they're only like five mil tall. You see how small that is? Yeah. It didn't make a ding, but <laughs> it's definitely steel. All right, so we'll go ahead and get these other three out. And again, they're very short, so you don't have to turn them very much to get them out. And I like to kind of loosen them all in kind of a sequence so that there's no hang-ups anywhere. That one came out. You can see if, I don't know how well you can see this, but the plate's actually loose already. I'm going to get one more out. I'm going to be very careful here because I don't want to stretch any wires out. Hopefully I can show you guys this without doing that. All right, so there's the front off. And I'm going to again put this down here so you guys can see it. I'm going to try to slide this off. I'm going to look down straight down on top of this while I'm pulling it apart to make sure that I have enough room to do that. There should be because they had to assemble this. Unless they assembled it and then tightened the wires, pulled them from the rear to tighten them up a bit or take slack out of it. But this looks like I'll have enough room without creating any issues. There we go. All right, that's nice. So we've got the close-up camera here. I'm going to see if I can't dangle this down so you guys can see what's going on. So here's the other part of that circuitry. So this is actually inducing the magnetic field in this ring here. And then, of course, it's being picked up by our guy over here, right, on the hub. And you can also see in here that our wireless receiver is this guy right down there. See the blue part? And you should be able to see some, some kind of, like, it looks like a, a digital DC signal on a pattern there, and that's the antenna, right? So you don't need much antenna if you're facing directly towards the receiver or transceiver on the other side, like sim magic setups do. So this is much more elegant solution than, yeah, just about anything I've seen out there so far. So that's what it looks like. Not much else to see. We do have some wires hanging down here that are going in. You can see how they're going in here. So there's a journal or a channel cut inside the servo motor in production for them to be able to use that. So right from production, the initial design, when they were making this wheel and Sim Magic wheels in general, they knew what they were going to be doing as far as their wireless setups and ordered their servo motors to be able to accompany or have these wires in it. I don't know, they might even have been able to drill them, depending on how the servo motor itself is constructed. All right, so I'm going to gently put this back on here like this. I don't want to mess anything up, obviously. And then when we're putting this back on, I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to be looking straight down where those wires are to make sure when I get this back on here and I kind of press it down, I want to make sure that the wires don't feel like they're being crushed or anything. All right, I just want to make sure there's plenty of room for them in there. All right, so there we have it. There's the front assembly of the Alpha Mini from Sim Magic. What we'll do next is when we come back, we'll take a look at what's going on inside the back. Now we can see what's on the other side of the wheelbase assembly. And we're going to remove this cover here. It's a pretty deep cover. And as you've seen in the closer look, it has on the side a USB and a power connector. On the other side, we've got a CAN bus and Safe B, which I imagine would be the emergency stop and CAN bus. It's like for firmware upgrades, things like that. I would think maybe not. It could be for something else. All right. So let's go ahead and take this off. I got four bolts. I guess I should have showed you that, huh? And those are 2.5 millimeter hex wrench size bolts on there. I believe there's the same M4 if it's following everything that's going on on the other side. And if you see any scratching on here, that's me. It didn't come out of the box that way. I want to make sure you guys didn't think that that's how it came out of the box and that, yes, I am the culprit there. And that happens to stuff sometimes at the SRG because I'm moving it around so much and mounting it, unmounting it, and doing all that crazy stuff for reviews. So let's go ahead and pull these off. I'm going to start with my two and a half. I'm going to kind of move it to the edge here a little bit so I can get to these bottom ones easily. It shouldn't be too tight, I would imagine. Yeah, there we go. Not nah, too bad. No reason to put Loctite on this, I guess. Because if you ever have to service it, you don't want to have to heat things up. With all those electrical components in there. I wouldn't want to anyway. Here we go. All right, so we got that loose. Now we'll take our other wrench and see if I can get this off without any dramas. There we go. Wow, that's a long bolt. 
All right, so this is an M4 flathead, and it seems to be a stainless steel unit. Let's see what the magnet says. Yep, see it hardly sticks. It's flopping around in there. So these are stainless steel units, no doubt. Let me get the other three out. And if you saw, I pushed this forward because, yeah, I don't want it hanging off the side with the cover coming off. That'd be a very bad idea. I think what I'm going to do is turn this. Let me look down first and see where my wires are. Okay. I'm going to stand this up on the front of the shaft where the quick release is. Shouldn't do any damage doing that. And then I'm going to show you guys the inside. I have a close-up camera over here. I can show you this. The wires are on the bottom back here, so I'm going to gently lift it and rotate it like this. There we go. All right, so there we can see the electronics in here. And yeah, first thing, no encoder sitting on the back of this. No resolver. It looks like to be like so many things, Sim Magic, their own custom design. So what they have here is it looks like to be a magnet. Let me, let's see. I'm going to use these pieces here. And these are very thin metal little grabber thingies. And yeah, so you can see that that's a magnet on the end of that. And this is the motor shaft that runs the whole length of the motor, the stator, whatever you want to call it, where the magnets are located. And then we have the coils and the windings around inside the housing here. Now, if I move this, you can see this is not moving. See how that screw stays there? So if we have it mounted, though, it's the other way around. The shaft is moving and this is not moving. What I wanted to show you is this piece here is sitting right above this magnet right here. See this little chip here? So that's the position sensor chip, little IC unit there, that they're using to read the magnetic field on this magnet here as it's turning and taking that information, obviously, and using it for motor control. So, yeah, again, here we are with SimMagic's got their own way of doing things, apparently, instead of, you know, the normal stuff you'd see on server motor. Got some big capacitors in here, probably, if I would imagine, for some smoothing. And, yeah, not, I could take this out, but I don't see any real reason to. It's a very clean board. You can see we have a lot of service mount components, the usual suspects here, you know, capacitors, resistors, and some other integrated circuit boards. So, yeah, very clean, I think. What do you guys think? Very well done there. So, yeah, I just want to see what was, you know, they were using here as far as position and control so that they can control the motor properly for the direct drive force feedback. So that's all there is to it. Not a whole lot to this one, right? <laughs> so what I'll do is go ahead and button this back up. And when we actually, I think this is it. This is finished the look inside. There's nothing else to see. I'm not going to completely disassemble the motor. No sense in doing that. You could, though. You see these four bolts up here. We could just take this whole case apart. But yeah, it's just an electric motor at the end of the day, just like all servo motors, right? Now we're going to look at different ways we can get our Alpha Mini mounted. There are a set of four holes that are M6 tapped on the bottom, and they are 67 millimeter centers this way and 80 this way. So it's a simple matter of taking a plate or whatever you're going to use to mount this to, wood, you know, whatever you're going to do, and drill this pattern into it. And then you can put your M6 bolts through that, whatever it is, and cinch it down tightly. And that should give you a pretty good solid base, I would imagine, especially if you had a, a nice flat deck mount that's metal. And yeah, you bolt this down with four bolts. I don't think you're going to have any problems with it flexing between the mount part. Now, of course, how you have your mount set up on your cockpit is a different story. Right. So we also have a couple of holes on the side here. And these are 50 millimeter centers. And you can put a, make your own bracket up or something. And again, M6 holes, do what you want to there. Or you can order the bracket set that comes for the Alpha Mini from SimMagic when you get your wheelbase, right? And this is a pretty cool bracket system. It's very clean. It's typical of what we see from SimMagic on the finish. Everything looks good and got a nice black finish to it here. Got a little notch cut out for, I guess, for some styling cues there. Each one has its own label still screened on here. This is for the right side, and this is for the left side. And how we're going to mount this, they give us eight of these M6 bolts, and they are eight millimeters deep. They are flatheads to fit in our countersunk holes that are on the brackets. We have this bracket 
is going to be the angle adjustment bracket and also has a flange on it to mount to whatever servers you're going to mount it to. They do provide you with some M8 bolts. And these are pan head or button head, whatever you want to call them. And they fit in here like this. So this is a good way to mount it to another metal deck or something or to profile it. we got a 40 series profile here. Let's get this out of the way. They give you, with your kit, these 40 series spring ball T-nuts. Nice. None of that uh, leaf spring stuff here. <laughs> or just a free-floating one. So they give you some nice T-nuts. That, of course, are going to fit in the profile channels of 40 series. Again, this is a 40 series. This would work also in a 45 series. The T-nut would not be as secure in the channel, but you could still cinch it down properly. So it would work in a 45 too. Then we would take this and set it here, and of course, take our button head over here, it's still in this bracket, put it through the bracket, and we can mount it right there like that. And we have one in the front and one in the back, and you can move it sideways. And you even have some range for moving it this way too. So it's nice they actually thought of that. Somebody might want to mount this to some profile. <laughs> All right. But we're not going to be do, doing it that way. We're going to be doing it just with the side brackets here. I'm not going to mount anything. I'm going to be using a front mount, which I'm going to cover in the mounting also. Let's see. This is the right, so we're not going to, we're going to work on the left side here. So we'll use the left. And again, these brackets are also countersunk for our angle adjustment. And you have to put this on first. And this is the right side I'm going to put over here. Now, how you tell the difference? Well, they're labeled, right, first off. But you're going to want these two holes here pointing towards the front of the wheelbase where you're going to attach your steering wheel because these are used for the angle adjustment. So obviously, if I put this here, that's not going to work. Even if it wasn't labeled, I might be able to figure that out anyway. Sometimes I get lucky. <laughs> so... Yeah, this one will be the one that we're going to use. And, of course, it's conveniently labeled with the L. And this one over here also has an L next to the Silkscreen Sim Magic logo. Well, I'm going to put this on first. Again, I'll get a couple of these flat heads. These are, by the way, 4 millimeter is the size of the wrench. And they give you a wrench in your pack to use. But I'm going to use these guys. Or, rather, this guy. That's a 3. This is a 4. So let's go ahead and put this up here. Go ahead and line it up. Drop my screw in here and get her started leave it a little loose so i can get the other screw in without having to scratch everything up when i move the plate like that there we go so now we have the plate installed we have our two holes here pointing towards the front now it's just a matter of getting this bracket mounted now if you only use two bolts for this even though there's two holes in there you might think that you use two holes and you have two bolts here and you have one back here on the pivot. That's not the way the system works. I'm going to go ahead and get the pivot installed. And I'll show you how this is going. Let's go ahead and get started my fingers there. Go ahead and run her down. Got to love these little T-nut, or rather T-wrenches. And I'm going to go flat first. I'm going to go ahead and put this. First, I'm going to show you the hole. And show you the way this is working. Make sure I'm going to loosen this up just a little bit. So move freely. So we have two holes, but they match up in an alternating pattern here. The very bottom front one, if I'm flat, that lines up. You can see the hole there. Now, if I want some angle, then I can come down. Watch the back hole. First back one. See how that lines up? There it goes. So now that lines up with the back hole. And then the front one, if I want it more angle, will line up with the other hole. So I'll get a good look. There it is. And you alternate back and forth. So that gives us a more finite adjustment capability on our angle than if I just had, put this down, two, if I had two lined up and they were like in an angle so that you could put two bolts in at once, that's going to limit our angle adjustments to just four. Here we have one, two, three, we have actually eight different angles that we can adjust this to. I would typically run this, I'm pretty sure, flat because of the cockpit that I have and the way I sit in my cockpit. Now, of course, that's going to be very subjective and everybody's going to have a little bit different situation. So, again, let's turn this around so you can see what I'm doing here. So, again, that would uh, listen to this just a hair. There we go. Depends on your cockpit. So, there we have it. Now, you can also notice that this protrudes off the bottom. 
And the other bracket that I have from Sim Magic for their M10 did the same thing. You know, it's it's all personal preference, but I'd like to see if, if it was flat here, maybe far enough down so it, this contacts too to give me more surface areas sitting on the plate. Um, again, that's that's just something that I think would give it a little bit more stability, having this sitting flat on a metal plate and then this mounted flat too. But then again, with the clearance underneath here when it's mounted and when you have everything cinched down tightly, I never saw any flex in anything. I never felt like it was, you know, something you wouldn't want to do. But I don't know, just for aesthetics, I like to see it flat, sitting flat. But anyway, there you go. So we would put the other bracket on just like we put this bracket on and then we're done. Then we go ahead and mount it to where we're going to mount it to, either using the T-nuts for profile or just taking our bolts from longer, depending on the thickness of the plate you're mounting it to, you might need something longer than this to run a nut on the end, maybe a nylock nut on the bottom to keep everything nice and stiff and secure. So there we have it. That's the mount that you can get from SimMagic. When we come back, we'll talk about mounting this puppy on a front mount, like on a P1X or some other cockpits that have those thick front mount plates. And that's the way I'm going to mount this one. Now I'm going to mount the Alpha Mini to a front motor mount mount system. This one is off of P1X, but the ones for ASR, Bant Sim Racing, the ones that I've tested for All-in-One Gaming, their Pro Series, they have enough length or space in their slots. And these are where we put the bolts in on these front plates. So there's enough room in here to cover the spacing of the M8 holes that are in the front flange. I'll show you that. So we've got M8 holes here and they're also threaded for M8. So we don't need a bolt or a nut on the back unless you want to put one there for extra security. It's totally up to you. They are through hole on the flange. So you can see they come out the back here. I can take my little stick here and go through it. But on the bottom, they're not. On the bottom, to keep things flat, I guess, they're not through hole. They're actually going into the case. So that means we have to pay attention to the length of the M8 bolt that we'll be using. Now this is a 20 millimeter M8 bolt and it's not going to be long enough. It's, you can do the math or you can just put it up there and look and see that if I hold this up against there from flat, you can see that I barely have maybe five mils sticking up there. So that's not going to be enough to make me comfortable <laughs> with the motor hanging off at that angle. So what we're going to do is measure the depth of the hole and see where we're at. And I'll use a set of calipers for that. And if calipers have this little thing on the bottom that we can take and stick into a hole and see how deep it is. So I'm bottom mounting the hole there. And now I can just kind of slide this down. And it gives me 39.7.6 And 39.6. So that's what it gives us. Now, just because the hole's that deep doesn't mean I have a, the bolt that I'm going to use can go that deep. It depends on how far they tap the threads into the hole. And I can see pretty clearly here, it doesn't look like... Let me hold it up here in the light. It looks like they're going pretty far down into the thread hole but when I take a this is a 25 millimeter M8 socket head cap if I take that and run it into the hole like so it stops there so you can see that's as far as it's going to go even though I can see threads further down in there it really gets hard to turn there and obviously you don't want to force the issue so if I take a just a measurement here. Well, I know this is 25 millimeters long, so I'll just go ahead and pull this out and take a measurement here before I pull it out. Turn it sideways. So it's bottoming out right at 10.3 mil. All right, so we'll just pull it right back out. 10.29 mils where it's bottoming out. That means the rest of this, and this is a 25 millimeter, so about 15, 
little over 15 mil would be sticking in. And the 10 mil, unfortunately, won't make it through this. This is gonna, this is a 15 mil flange on this particular one. This is a P1X, yeah, 15 mil. So this is gonna give me enough to get in there. If I tried to go with something deeper, remember I've got 39 or whatever it was, <laughs> the deepness in the hole, but the bolt doesn't go that far, right? The bolt's only going in 15 mil. And I'm looking in there, I can see threads. You know, this is gonna be hard to show you guys. Yeah, but there's a, there's a black part of the thread and then there's a silver part. You might see the reflection in there. It's hard for me to tell on this little monitor on this camera. But you might be able to see some silver threading that goes even deeper, but the bolt is actually stopping only 15 millimeters in. So it must be a taper in there. I'm not sure how they did that. But anyway, important thing is, is figuring out how to get this thing mounted tightly. Now I have a long bolt here. I believe this is 35... 40. Yeah, this is a 40 millimeter bolt. You can see it has a smooth shank on the top part of it. And this is going to be too long. If I put this, let's go ahead and put this flange on here. And to do that, I'm going to use this piece of maple block because the side mounts are going to hit the table here and won't let it sit flush on top of the motor itself, which is exactly what we want it to do. So, oh, <laughs> take my wood out. Don't even put it on there. Uh, this way, Barry. There we go. All right. Now we just kind of sit this down on top. I can look straight down here and see the holes where they're lining up when I move this around. And I've got it. Yeah, the holes are going to be inside. They're not going to be like sticking halfway out of the the edge of this round part here, the hole that's cut out there. So we've got plenty of space to grab onto, and I'll be using these washers also. So if I take this one which is the 40, obviously that's going to be too long. And you'd think with a hole of 30, what was it, 37 millimeters deep, that this would be okay because it's 40 plus 15. Yeah, it should make it, but you can see it's not going down deep enough. No way that's going to work. So we're going to go with these 25s because that will go down far enough to make me comfortable that I've got enough grip. And I'm going to use one that has the washer because Obviously, the washer takes up some space. Not much. Maybe a mil or so. Yeah, one and a half mil on this uh, washer, so not taking up much space. And you can see as I start bolting this in, you can see how much I have to go in. So if I can get four of these in there like that, go ahead and get this one over here across from it started. Also give you an idea of where it's going to be riding. And you can, once these are in, I usually slide the mount around a little bit to see where the best place is to have the motor mounted. Now you can also do this with the bracket mounted to the cockpit, but it's a little bit more fiddly when you do it that way, instead of just taking the whole thing over there and putting it in. Of course, you can do it any way you want to. Whatever's easiest for you is what's important. I'm going to go ahead and get these in. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of run this in a little bit, see where I'm at. It's pretty much even as far as the overhang on the washers, and that's really what I'm looking at, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here just as I get this tightened down a little bit, get a little snug on these guys, and I'll do a final torque in a little bit. And you can torque down pretty hard because the socket heads are actually engaging the bracket. Even though I have a washer on here, the washer is, all the pressure is not on that thin washer. It's actually engaging the bracket material, which is what you want. You don't want a, a small head that's not big enough to engage the bracket material around that slot and then just throw a washer on it because that would just pull right through the washer once you torch it down. Anyway, so this is what we have. Pull this around. Now we got wheel and bracket. <laughs> but you can see that the washers are hanging just a little bit on the edge. I don't know if this is showing up. Proud of the actual flange of the metal, of the metal of the flange here because of the way it's mounted in there. But that's good enough. This should make a very solid mount, I think. I don't have any, any worries about that. And my wireless sensor is still sitting out there, so we should have no problem with that, no interference. So yeah, I think it's looking good. So now all we have to do is go over to the rig and get this mounted. So when we come back, we'll see how that went.
Here's our Alpha Mini, securely mounted to the P1X front mount motor bracket. And this is a very solid mount. I've got good engagement here on the front. I really don't need the washers. The button head bolts would be able to engage by themselves. But I like to use the washers just for ease of turning when we're torquing down the bolts. And I like the engagement that I'm getting on the back from the flange here on the motor to the plate. Now you can see some air gaps here. That's because we're at the extremes of the slots here where the holes cut out in the bracket. But not to worry, we got some nice engagement down here and across the bottom too at each corner is really all we need. And if I put this, my hand on the very back of this and try to twist it at all, yeah, it's not moving. Nice and stiff. And this is the way you want to mount a direct drive wheel if you can. Because when it's mounted very solidly like this, it allows the wheel's motor to deliver the best force feedback fidelity that it can. And it really can allow you to see the ultimate or the, the most performance that you can squeeze out of these things. So this will allow me to do that. And again, I always try to get motors mounted to something solid like this when I'm testing them. Just so that, you know, if there's flex in it, that's going to dampen the, the finer details of the force feedback that the motor is capable of delivering. And yeah, that's the last thing we want, I think, to give it a fair test. So there it is. It's mounted solidly. All I have to do now is get in and start driving it, and we'll take a look at the controller software that comes from SimMagic for this wheelbase. All right, so I have the Alpha Manager, the latest edition, up. And this is the controller software we're going to be using to set our settings for the wheel as far as force feedback any of the customizations of that force feedback. I'm in the setting tab right now and all the tabs are lined up here on the left. And I'm in mechanical setting. And this is where we're gonna do most of our tuning when we're live tuning or you're in the car running it. You can do this and it, and it takes effect in real time. So we have first total force over here. And of course that's the maximum Newton meters of torque that we give the wheel. Right now default it's at 51, so that's kind of low, but I'm sure I'll be running this at 100%. We'll go down here to wheel inertia, and that should add some weight to the wheel when we're turning it. If inertia means the same thing in this app as it does in most, we have the wheel damper. Of course, that's going to dampen the wheel effects. And we also have a smooth level, smoothing things out. I imagine smooth level and damping will have it's kind of like a subset of each other. I'm not sure how they have it configured in their firmware. But yeah, usually they do kind of the same thing. So wheel spring, that's going to be the resistance when we turn the wheel. And friction is just going to be, again, kind of a weight thing in the, when we're actually turning the wheel. And you can see these are the default settings. I'm going to start with those in my live tuning. Game effect, if your game supports it, this is where you would be setting the game spring, inertia, friction, things like that. Over here, we have the center control, and it tells us where the steering wheel is. And I'll try to center that up. It's not easy to do. <laughs> so, yeah, it's close enough right there. But this is where if the wheel's not centered, I would center it. And then I would press center. Right now it's 2.30, so I'll center it, and it will come out to zero. Simple enough. Very easy to do. Wheel angle, we can set that in here. If a game, sometimes the game will override this and set it at something, but we can actually manually set it in here, I think, and override what's in the game. Sync, that simply means that if I set this to 900, then the angle limit will be 900. But if you can see right here, I've got 720 in here because I've been messing around with it. And if I take this, first, before I do that, 900, it should do 900 degrees of rotation when I turn this wheel. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it, and there's 450 one way, and there's 450 the other. Go ahead and center it back up. Now, that's when it's synced. Let's say I want, for whatever reasons, I only want it to go 720. I'll uncheck sync, and now it should only go about 360, I believe. So let's see what we get here. Yep, 360 one way, 360 the other. Huh, pretty cool feature there. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it back on sync, though. Vehicle setting, wheel speed, uh, suspension. I haven't used this yet. I'm not sure exactly how this is going to affect what we feel, but I'll mess with it once I get up there. Wheel speed, how fast we're turning it, I guess. And suspension, maybe the effect of suspension on the wheel. Not sure exactly what that means yet. Anyway, we're going to go in here 
and I can read the base, I can write storage, I can save. So if I want to save this configuration, I would save it and I click save and a little menu pops up and we'll be able to save this as an any file, a .ini file, which also means we can open these up and edit them in a text editor if you wanted to do that. But it's just saving the settings we've already set over here in the application. So yeah, unless you really need to do it for some reason or another, probably never do that. And then we just save it and name it whatever we want over here in this line. Easy enough. So let's go over to the calibration. Now this is where we have some accesses. Now I'm not sure what these X, Y, and Z's on the top are for, but I know what the R, Y, and Z are. That's for our analog paddles that are on the wheel. So if I take the analog paddles, and I'll do that now, I'll pull them both in, and you can see they're both moving, okay, as separate paddles. And this is if I wanted to set up a brake and a throttle or something here, I could do that. But if I take over here in the switch and I turn it over to, I, forget what, I believe it's the all the way to the left, yeah, then it goes to RY. And that means I have in, in dual clutch mode now. So I can pull in both clutches. I can release the right for a start. And then I would go in and let the rest of the clutch out like in a normal dual clutch mode. And that's where I could actually set this up and change the whatever, wherever I wanted to engage it, I could change it in here. We also have a testing here so I can press my buttons and you can see the buttons are lighting up and my seven way switch on the right is working. Eight, nine go left or rather right and I can go left I can push the button go up or down and this is where you would test all your functionality and everything all the buttons are working I have no problem with the buttons here everything's fine so that's where we do our calibration at now let's go down to the state this tells us what state the wheel is currently in and over here on the system state because it's got the green line I'll just go over there real quick and show you it's normal and this will tell you whatever state that you're currently in depending on what you're doing. Over here on system message, tells you the firmware. I'm currently on, it says 7054, but the firmware that I put in here was 6054. So I'm not sure why it says 70, but there you go. Software, this is version 2.2 of the Alpha Manager and the Shenzhen Symmagic Technology, okay. And where voltage is currently 35 volts. Remember our power supply does put out 36 volts at six amp max. Channel 60, that is for the channel that my wireless wheel is on. It's registering it. Limit hardness, this is the stop hardness, and the limit is right now is at four, which is pretty hard. I mean, it's like hitting a brick wall. <laughs> but you can change that if you want something softer. I'll just go ahead and take the slider and put it down to two. And right away, yeah, it's not as hard. It's still hard, but it's got a softer landing. And not only that, it doesn't, if you let it sit there and you push on it, it'll vibrate a little bit, okay? Because we're at the limit of the brake. See how it's shaking a little bit? Oh, how well this video's gonna show up. But yeah, but it's mainly a stop. You're never gonna hold it there like that, at least not normally under racing conditions. So yeah, that's, uh, I get it vibrate again, yeah, okay. But anyway, normally you won't do that, but that's where you would set how soft you want that limit to be. Very simple stuff. Now let's go down to bootload. This is where you would do your updating of your firmware. And this will tell you version message. Selected file is 6054. Now I've just did the 6054 firmware update. And all you gotta do is you go find the latest firmware you have. You choose the file, download on computer obviously. Then I would go in and choose the file. When I do that, I click on choose file. Well, it's actually 100%. So you choose file, it's already chosen. So that's why now it's not doing it. Then you go over here and click download. Because I've already done this, I'm not going to do it again, but I am going to show you some B-roll of this thing actually uploading the firmware to the wheel base from the computer. And you can see it's a percentile kind of thing, a little blue bar moving over to the right. And then once it's complete, we see 100%. Then you will reboot the wheel and the firmware should change from wherever it was before to the new firmware you've installed. So I'm just showing you guys some B-roll of that. So pretty simple, it worked the first time, I didn't have any problems with it. So a nice smooth experience there with no problems, no dramas, which I can appreciate. If you've ever tried to update firmware on different other wheels like uh, whatever wheel, just take your pick. <laughs> it's, it's nice to have something just work the first time and you don't have to do anything else. 
So there it is. That's the Alpha Manager. Of course, we're going to be spending all of our time over here in the mechanical setting part where we're going to be doing some tuning in a live session, which we will get to next. I'm going to do some live tuning here and see how this works out for me. As far as I'm going to start out at the default on this Alpha Manager and it is at 50 at total force, which is half the force. A little bit of smoothing, five. And I don't know if this is really the default because I just used this data any and on here and it bought up this configuration. I already have another configuration I've saved that I'll show you later on uh, and see how close I can get to it by using this one. And yeah, so we're just gonna get in the car here. This is the Ferrari 488 GT3 and we're at Sebring, my favorite test bed for this kind of thing because all the bumps and stuff that's going on at this track, it really lets you know what a wheel is capable of doing. And it usually displays any good or not so good traits in a wheelbase when you're using it. So let's go ahead and use this configuration here. Now remember, this is mostly what we play with here in iRacing. We don't use the game effect because iRacing doesn't have any of that. If we set a course, I think we could use this. But yeah, in iRacing, we don't. Suspension down here and wheel speed. I played a little bit with that. Wheel speed, I, couldn't, I really couldn't figure out what that was doing. But suspension, that gives you sharper effects. And right now it's sitting at one. So I usually keep it there because you turn this up, you get more detail. But you also get some more artifacts, I think, over this around the center where it's, it feels a little notchy to me anyway. So we're going to get in the Ferrari here. I got the volume turned down pretty low, so that shouldn't cause any problems for us, I hope. All right. Let's go ahead and... Oh, my field of view is messed up. Yeah, I was in a single screen mode before <laughs> I did this. Let me get back out of here. I usually not that far up on the dash, obviously. And it's nice having these seven ways. I can do all this adjustment for my field of view and stuff where I can see my mirror over there and I can see it here. It's usually where I have it. Mirror there, mirror there. All right. And again, you can do that to whatever's comfortable with you and makes you quicker. Consistent laps is what it's all about. So let's go ahead and get out on the track. Okay. And default's not going to be that great. It's obviously, I don't like it this light. It's only, should be five newton meters if this is 10 newton meter peak. It doesn't feel bad. There's detail there for certain. I can feel the transitions from the track there. I am running it at 25 max force down here though. So keep that in mind too. But it's very light. But I am getting force feedback. It's just not as much that I would like to have for trying to connect a, you know, a slide or something, even though, yeah, I held it there. It's just not something I would be driving with. But there's enough detail. In fact, it'll even oscillate on you, hitting brakes. Well, maybe it won't. <laughs> it's just not enough power there. But yeah, it's way too light for me. But the force feedback is still there. So if you don't like a lot of force and you're not used to a direct drive wheel, then you might want to start out somewhere around this level. But I, I can barely feel myself going over the transition between the asphalt and the concrete. So that's not where I would have this. So we are tuning this for me. And remember, this is all subjective. What could be more subjective than this stuff? I don't know. So I'm, first thing I'm going to do is turn this up to 100. And that'll give me the full 10, 10 newton meters of force. I'm leaving this at 25. I'm going to get out of the car and show you that when I was at five, I should have been, go here, options. I should have been in the wheel force down here, should have been at five newton meter. But I knew I wasn't going to be driving for that, at that strength very long, so I just left it at 10. So now we're at 10 newton meter for wheel force. I'm at 25 newton meters on max force. And of course, I can change that on the fly when I'm in the car with my little black box. And of course, I can go through my different black boxes with my other seven way switch on this wheel. So I really like this wheel, all the controls that you have here, and all the functionality. I'm going to leave that at 25 newton meter, but now I've gone back up to 10 newton meter peak. So obviously right away, I'm going to be feeling something different. Yep. Now that's more like it. Now I've got some force. And the more force you have the, as far as newton meters, 
the more detail and the more weight transfer that detail is available to me and what the car is doing because I can feel the inertia and the spring working more in the wheel itself. But right now I've got some notchiness around the center, which is not uncommon for direct drive wheels. And it's almost like if you're driving a rack and pinion equipped vehicle and you needed some lube in the rack or it was wearing out one or the other, it just feels notchy around the center when we're doing our transitions. The weight transfer in the wheel feels good at this as far as the inertia and friction feels. It feels like I'm really steering a, a heavier car back and forth across the track. Of course, that goes away the faster you go. So I'm going to go ahead and get up to speed here. I already don't like what I'm feeling around the center of these settings. So we'll go up, get the speed, get some braking zones. Go to the dirt corner. That felt pretty good. But yeah, the notchiness around the center is just something that, again, personal preference, I just don't like it. I want it as smooth as possible. Now, the good thing news is there is no gap anywhere. There's no dead zone around center on this wheel. You feel the pressure all the way through the swing. Some wheels right in the center, it's like there's this little gap of no force. And this doesn't have that. So that's great right out of the box. But I'm going to go ahead and here's what I'm going to do. We're at smoothing level five. And my suspension is one. If I turn that up any higher, that just means it's going to do more detail, which probably is going to make it worse or more pronounced. Worse is relative depending on who's talking about what they're feeling. I'm going to bring up the wheel damper. I'm just going to go, I know because I've done this already, I'm going to take it up to 30. And I have to be careful when I'm using these sliders because this app tends to jump. <laughs> and when you're using a slider, when you click on the slider line, for some reason, if you click on either side of that line, it wants to jump around. And it even jumps as far as down into my bottom screens, which makes everything mess up. So try to avoid that while I'm doing this. All right, we're at 30. So let's go ahead and see how that feels yeah right away i'm already feeling less notchiness around the center and i still got plenty of detail i could feel all of that you saw this movement in the wheel it was pretty sharp so i'm not missing any detail at all let's go around this is a very bumpy corner yeah still a little bit too much for me so i'm going to Turn this down. I'm going to not turn it down. I'm actually going to go up to 40 on my damper. See how it jumped? Got to be careful. This will mess up my whole video if it jumps down in my other window down there. Okay, so we're at 40 now. 10 more points of damping should be noticeable right away. Go over some bumps. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely the that little bit of a ripple or a little notchy feel that I get is definitely less than it was before. That's a good bump there coming off of that rumble strip when you go inside and then come back outside of it. Gives it a big jolt here on this Ferrari. All right. That feels better. Still a little bit there, so I'm going to go on my smoothing. My power is good. Total force is good. I'm not going to mess with that. But I am going to take my smoothing up to six and see what that does. I might go back to suspension over here and do something with that. So instead of just having on one. All right. Yeah, still some there. It's not that it's upsetting to me or anything. I can drive it this way, no problem. But if I got it all the way out, I got a feeling that I would be losing some detail that I want. So, yeah. It just feels like there's a, like something, like somebody's got a, a small rubber mallet and tapping on the center there when you go around it, when you get those jolts. So I want that jolt delivery, because I'm at full power too, so obviously everything's being amplified to the max. Well, my smoothing level's back to three. I don't know how that happened. I'm just going to take it up to seven. Maybe that's why I was feeling it, huh? Sometimes these things move. I don't know why. Maybe it's my trackball and I accidentally hit it and it moves. Okay. All right, so we're at seven on smooth. Left dampening at 40. Still at one on suspension. Already, yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. It was a three. No wonder it was feeling weird. <laughs> All right, so we're back at seven now. Yeah. 
Now this is feeling better. This is feeling more like what I think I would have it at. There's still a little bit, very faint notchiness around the center, but it's almost all gone now. And I'm still getting enough detail, I believe. I'll know when I get down here that it's the detail that I want to feel in the car to allow me to control it properly. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That was good and sharp through there. Let's see what my transition feels like going across this concrete. Good. See how the wheel moved there? It moved, but it was a smooth, heavy move. Not a notchy, snappy little move. I want things to be smooth. It, it feels more analogous to me when it's that way. But I still want detail. <laughs> yeah, I know. We want it all, don't we? <laughs> so, yeah. Go through this section. That's feeling pretty good. Good rumble across the strip there. That's good. Let's try this one. A little transition. Good there. Do my little cut through here. Barely legal. Cut through the rumbles. Yeah, that was good. Sharp coming off of it, but not notchy sharp. Good rumbles here. Yep, excellent there. I'm really liking this where it's at right now. Got a little bit of wheel friction in there at 10. Smoothing 7 now. A little bit of inertia at 10. I suppose I could tweak around with that a little bit, but it's almost like when you get to a point where you're feeling it, feeling what the car is doing and you're able to react to it and catch things when they go wrong, like that, you kind of want to leave it alone because it's, that's how you go fast. <laughs> able to quickly do the input corrections you need to do in a car steering when we're racing so that we can be consistent and we become familiar with what it's doing. Yeah, that's, that felt good through there. Yeah, that's what I like. You can really feel what the car at suspension is doing when we're coming through these rough spots. And when you're turning in the rough spots, you can really get out of sorts quickly. Good. See, I could feel that right away, the, the way it was getting light in the front, and correct for it, that little slide there. And that's what, again, that's why we get these direct drive force feedback wheelbases for. Because they're quick enough and powerful enough to let us feel all that. Yeah. Yeah, I got no problem with this here. Yeah, it's, it's smooth around the, the center now. Just a faint bit of notch left. If And I have to feel for it to get it, to, to see it again or feel it again. Just a faint bit there, but I really like what I got right now. Now, this is very subjective. Someone else gets in here and drives this and goes, oh my God, this is horrible. So you have to tune it to your own liking. And just to check, I'm going to save this. I'm going to save this as. I'm going to do two because I've already got one that I saved for iRacing here. So I'm going to make this a two. Get my gloves out of the way. All right, we'll save that as two. And now I'm going to watch this as I load the one I had before and see what's different. So we've got 110, 40, 7010. We've saved it. So I'm going to load final one again. Yeah. All right, so I got a little more inertia in here. I got a little bit less smooth, but my, see my dampening has gone up though. So uh, less smoothing, but more damping. And that's, you know, you have to adjust. One affects the other when you adjust it. So let's see what that remember. If that recalls to me that it, what I wanted before and how it compares, I got a little bit more inertia in there. Inertia is when you're turning it, when you stop, try to stop it from turning. The spring also comes into play in that field too. The spring is the spring back where it keeps pushing back against you when you're turning it. Well, that feels pretty good. What was that? Smooth level is down to six and we're up to 50. A little bit more inertia in there. Feels pretty good. Yeah, that was smooth but detailed. Again, the change was I went up higher on the wheel damper and came back on the smoother. And everything else, well, it was the five more points of inertia there too. But other than that, it looks like it's the same. I'm happy with this. Yeah, okay. So that's what I had when I was messing around with it before, spending some time just feeling what the wheel was capable of doing. 
All right, so again, with the caveat that this is very subjective stuff, at least it'll give you an idea. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm able to control the car and keep it from sliding out of control. So that's, that's the main thing to do there also. I like what I'm feeling here. I can probably get some oscillation on this. Let's see how that works. Get some speed up here and I'm going to, there you go. See the oscillation? Now when I hit the brakes, look at the oscillation. Now, if I was on a smooth tarmac, then yeah, it would be a lot less of that. This corner in here at Sebring is notorious for all the bumps it has. And when you're on hard on the brakes and you're hitting all those bumps at the same time, you get all that weight transfer at the front, you're really getting some shocks through the steering system in a car. And that's why it's a lot harder turn to make at speed than a lot of people think when they see cars racing at Sebring because of all these bumps wanting to throw you out, just like 17 back there. One's kind of like that, but not quite as severe, but it'll still throw you out of sorts pretty quickly. But yeah, like this, I can barely feel a little bit of that notchiness, just barely though. I had to really feel for it. That was there before when I had the original data in there, but yeah. But it did take me some smoothing and some uh, wheel damper to get that out, didn't it? So I'm happy with this. I'm able to get to where I need to be to control the car, end of the day. And that's what all this stuff is about. Being able to control the car so that you can put in your consistent laps and get used to feeling what every turn feels like and where you need to be in that turn based on how much you can feel through the wheel as far as details and your force feedback. And braking is very important because you can feel the front end getting light when you start to lose the grip. So this little wheel here, there's this Alpha Mini is really doing a pretty good job. 10 Newton meters. I'd like to have more power, obviously. That's just me. But I think for anyone who, especially somebody that's coming from a belt drive or cog or a gear drive type wheel, this is going to be plenty of torque for them. Other wheels are like 50, the Alpha, regular Alpha is 15. I would like to test one of those because I think that's probably more like the sweet 20 is probably the sweet spot for me. But I've been doing this a long time and I've built up some muscle to where I'm able to, you know, that's just the forces that I feel good with. It feels more analogous to me when I have a bit more force. The usual wheel I run goes up to 25 newton meters, but I usually do not run it at 25. I'm usually somewhere between that and 20. And depending on the car and the track, I might even go lower than 20 newton meters again. But it's good to have the overhead if you need it instead of need it and not have it. <laughs> this has been my theory for most things. But yeah, we're pretty good here. Pretty good. So those are my settings for iRacing. And this is the Ferrari 488 again. We're at Sebring. Again, I would be changing this if I was going to an LMP car or, you know, one of the F1 cars, something like that. You're going you're gonna to play with this a little bit and get it to feel like you're really controlling the car. That's always been my goal. Do I feel like I'm really controlling the car that I'm driving? And of course, I can't drive these cars in real life, so I really don't know, do I? Nobody does unless you drive them. But a real car, we got G-forces when we're driving them, so we don't need all this force feedback. Simulation, we need it so that we can understand what's going on with the car. In a day, that's really the bottom line. Can you feel what the car is doing and encounter in your wheel? And yeah, this one, you can do it. I really don't have anything, except for that, I'd like to see that notchiness go away completely. I can still feel a little bit of it when I'm doing this, but only when I'm doing this, feeling for it. It's pretty smooth now. And again, no dead zones. So that's very important too. So I don't have a lot to complain about here, except for that. I guess I'll pull, I'll, I'll complain about that. And another thing I like to point out here is the wireless. I don't know how well you're going to see this through the video, but you can see the little green light down here. With the monitors pulled in tight like this, the way I like them, they're at 60 degrees. So when I'm looking through turns, it's like a natural thing. This line really disappears. You really don't even notice it when you're driving. I mean, look at all these other lines we have in here. We got the A pillars and all this other stuff going on. So I've got them close in though. You can see how far it, my hand is like, uh, I guess it would be like three inches, you know, maybe 70 millimeters between the shifters in my hands here. So I might make sure I don't hit the screen obviously. But pulled in tight like this gives you that surround feel that you're looking through naturally. But if I have a wireless wheel that has an antenna sticking on the back of the motor back there, then now I've got the monitors dropped down. I've got this plate in the way of it. And you can see that that would not be as efficient as this here because now it's 
doesn't really matter because I can still see it. My wheel transceiver over here that's behind the wheel that I showed you before can see it. So that's just something I wanted to point out. Yeah, this is definitely an optimal way to do a wireless solution. I don't understand why you would not do this because of everything that we're doing. Now, if you're just a VR user, of course, you don't have to worry about that stuff. But yeah, we've got all this stuff in front of the antenna that would be back on, let's say, a semi-cube on the back back there, which obviously is not helping it. Right, so there it is. We got it tuned. I like what I have, and we'll just move on. I'll probably just go ahead and show you guys some video of me actually driving in different conditions um, with this wheel, the GT4, and the round wheel, some dirt maybe or something, but just some dr basic driving footage at speed where I can focus and concentrate on what I'm doing and see if I can get the same lap times I normally do. So we're at the ring in iRacing and we are in the Ferrari 488 GT3 again, keeping the car the same, but these are very different tracks. This one feels silky smooth compared to Sebring, <laughs> even though it has its own fair share of some bumps here and there and some heavy curbing. I was able to get another setting here I kept the, well, I'm at 100% already, so I couldn't go any higher in the torque. But in a smoother track, you feel more nuances than you do in a track like Sebring where you're constantly getting hammered by all the bumps. So I felt the nuances here that changed the way that I wanted the wheel to feel. I didn't like, I felt it was a little bit sharp on the impacts because it, it was so smooth everywhere else that you notice it more. So I went up in the damping and I went up in the smoothing I went up the damping as high as I think 65 and the smoothing another point to seven to get the feel that I wanted to feel like I was able to understand what the car suspension was doing and react to that and the grip of the car at the same time. Now, being 10 Newton meters, this is way below what I normally run and I have to take that into account and you should too when you hear my opinions and statements about it. Yeah, it's, I was chasing something that you can't get with this wheel as far as going in a higher Newton meter level. So you have to maintain your perspective correctly. So at 10 Newton meters max, I think I was squeezing the max performance I could get out of this wheel. The good news is I was able to get enough settings out of it, or they have enough settings in the controller app, that alpha controller app, that I was able to get it to where I thought was the maximum for it at a max torque that I was able to use. So yeah. I did have to dampen it out and smooth it out a little bit to get just more of a, a universal feel for the whole track on everything I was doing in the track when I'm running hard and paying attention to what I'm doing. So yeah, and again, this is all very, very subjective stuff. Don't let anybody, a YouTube reviewer like me or anybody else in a forum or something tell you what you need to have in your direct drive wheel because everybody's different. Everybody wants to feel things differently. And yeah, you just have to work with it yourself. The trick is having a wheelbase or a system that has enough adjustability in it that you can get it there. And I think most would be pretty happy with the adjustability in this wheel. If I could get it to where I felt comfortable with it and was getting pretty much the same times I normally do, I think most others could too. It's just, again, just like anything else, it might take a little bit of time to get it exactly where you want it. Now, I had the lighter wheel on that segment there and I'm, I went ahead and put, I don't show me myself driving here, but I put this heavier wheel on the round wheel from Sim Magic, and this wheel is actually a pound, about a pound and a half heavier than that GT wheel you just saw. And when I put this wheel on and ran the ring right away, I noticed a difference. So I'm here, I am. I'm going back the other way now. I'm taking some smoothing out. I'm taking some damping out, so that yeah, because it's a much heavier wheel, the mass for when you put it on this motor it notices right away, the motor does, and it just dampens everything out because of the inertia and the mass of the wheel changes. So you just adjust for it, and I was able to do that. And then I wanted to get over into some dirt and sling it around a little bit, the wheel spin it back and forth, just feel how it reacts to those situations and the rally stuff. Yeah, you don't get much detailed feedback here in the rally stuff because the suspension on these cars is so soft to begin with. You don't get the same thing you do like in a, obviously a, GT style car, or even an F1 car, even worse, you know, they're, they're even tighter suspensions. But I wanted to see how it acted here in the dirt too. And I was able to get another setting here. I didn't have to change much actually because of the lack of the force feedback fidelity you get in these conditions. Didn't have to change too much. You know, again, I'm already at maxing it out as far as the Newton meters. So there's not a, a lot to change there either because I'm certainly not gonna back it down because I could handle it anyway. Somebody else though might want to take some of it back out you know, so they can sling it around a little easier, depending on which 
wheelbase you're coming from, which type of technology you're coming from. If you're coming from a gear-driven or a belt-driven wheel, this is going to be a big eye-opener for you, as any direct drive wheelbase will be. The amount of force feedback fidelity you can get out of these things is just much, much better than anything that's belt drive or gear drive. And most people, I think, would agree with that statement. So anyway, I don't want to keep this too long. Again, the settings were pretty much the same as when I was doing the live driving session, except for increasing or decreasing the damping, depending on how heavy the wheel it was that was attached to the motor. And that's not uncommon for any motor that you're using, be it belt, direct drive, or gear, whatever. The heavier wheel you put on, it will dampen things down a little bit and you have to adjust accordingly so yeah i'm happy with what i can get out of this wheel i think the alpha controller software has enough settings to get you where you need to be to feel like you're actually controlling the car and really that's where we need to be that's the goal right that's why we get these wheels we want to be able to feel like we're controlling the car at the end of the day Final thoughts on the Alpha Mini Direct Drive Force Feedback Wheelbase. Out of the box, the Alpha Mini looks very much like the regular Alpha Wheelbase, sporting the same clean lines. Finish and fitment will stand with the best here. The connections for USB, power, CAN bus, and B-stop are located on the side of the wheelbase. I did not have any issues with the cables interfering with my mounting solution, although others may have a more confined space to mount their wheelbases, and it could be an issue. I would like to see these connectors located on the back of the wheelbase housing. And, while they're at it, I think it would be more convenient for the user if the power switch was also located on the back of the housing instead of on the power cord. This wheelbase uses what I call an NRG-style quick-release system, as do all of SimMagic wheelbases, using a ball bearing to dimple seating arrangement. This is a solid QR system that did not flex in my testing. SimMagic does make an adapter for those who wish to use their own QR solution with the SimMagic wheelbases. The wheelbase side adapter has contact pads that deliver 5 volts to the attached wheel. It is a wireless inductive arrangement, so there's no worry about twisting wires when turning the wheel. On the front of the mounting flange of the wheelbase, there is a wireless solution deployed. It looks very clean and should provide a more consistent and strong wireless connection than some of the other wireless solutions out there today. I never had any issues with the wireless connection during the time I had it under testing. The internals of the wheelbase look to be of high quality with a clean looking layout. There are several different ways to mount this wheelbase. There are M6 holes tapped on the bottom and side of the housing. You can also front mount this wheelbase using the provided M8 tapped holes on the motor flange. SimMagic has an available side mount solution that looks good and provides ample range of adjustment. The latest Alpha Manager tuning software provided me with enough adjustment range to get a very good feel for what the car I was driving was doing, which is essential to driving a car in a consistent manner. With a maximum torque of 10 newton meters, it should provide most racers with ample power to get a clear feel for a car's actions, allowing them to feel like they are actually controlling the car. As of this video's release, the price of the Alpha Mini comes in at $500. This is supposed to be an introductory offer that has already been running. It will end at the end of August 2021. After that, I have no idea what the price will be for this Alpha Mini from SimMagic. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.